stage is yours. Thank you very much. I'm going to take credit for <laughs> Mike Mathis and Nirav Shaw to follow. Um, first, my disclosures. Um, I am the uh, have some decision support software patents. I found it was a founder, president, and inventor, equity holder in AlertWatch, University of Michigan startup company. It was acquired by BioIntelligence. They're a company that makes a little sticker, transmits vital signs for 30 days. AlertWatch is the display, and it's marketed through Medtronic. Most of what I'll be doing out is the OR, but it's being applied through this sticker in the display to uh, floors and home. And everybody's sort of focused on where the real danger is, is when we take them out of the ICU or we send them home. Um, approximately one in 50 surgical patients undergoing open procedure will be dead within a month. Now, that's open procedures. But the data suggests that, as we reported earlier, about 190,000 cases a year, which would put it the third leading cause of death in the United States is perioperative mortality. Now, if we did everything perfect, we wouldn't cut this in half, but we may cut it down a bit. Even more discouraging, though, is maternal mortality, which uh, the rest of the world seems to be getting better, and we seem to be getting. Now, recently, the data's gotten a little better, but still, we're, for an industrialized nation, we're, it's pretty abysmal. So I'm going to talk about decision support in sort of three levels, in uh, three levels of sophistication. The first is um, decision support that's based on calculations and alerts. And these are things that are done live, but you could actually do them yourself if you had a calculator and somebody helping you do it. They aren't, they're, they're the farthest from AI. They're just bringing to, I'll, first, I'll talk three examples. One is this INO balance. I mean, it's just arithmetic, but it's very hard to do live while you're taking care of a patient. Uh, the next is escalating alerts to help us follow the protocol. So we have protocols. It's very easy when you have a problem to have a committee, develop a protocol, implement it, roll it out, it's very hard to follow it. I mean, it depends on very frequently the people that make up the protocol aren't the ones that are having to do the protocol. And virtually it falls on nurses most of the time. And they actually have another job, taking care of the patients. So sometimes following the protocol can get in the way. And this hopefully another form of this uh, decision support can help. And the last time it's machine learning, which we learned about. So I wanna, since I got the stage up here and you invited me, I, I'm gonna talk about my favorite subject, me. Okay, so um, how I got to where I am, I, I sort of just fell into things. In, in 75, I was, a, I was a graduate student in engineering, and I met a guy, Irv Fat. He was one of the developers of the soft contact lens, used to be glass. And he and his colleague, San Francisco, John Severinghaus, said, if you like to apply engineering to medicine, you should go to medical school, and you should probably try to work on non-invasive oxygen running. So they basically said, this is a 1975, that's what you should, that'd be a worthwhile project. Um, finished medical school, and then uh, I wanted to apply some of these techniques in humans. And so if you wanna work on monitoring outcomes on sick people, come work in my eyes too. That's been Will Shoemaker, and I worked with him for three years. Then I got to Michigan and I got some money to develop a system. And I said, if you wanna collect data from uh, clinical data, make an electronic, make an AIM system. So uh, I recruited Mike O'Reilly from University of Vermont. Uh, he was doing liver transplant anesthesia. And I said, look, I need a partner to help me develop a system. Um, would you do that? And on our third try, we went with one company failed, the second company failed, and we finally went with this little startup company called SEC, run by two brothers, Vic and Sachin Kaerpal. And uh, Sachin was the programmer, Vic was the president. And literally we know after eight months into the project that such and during the day was a medical student. At nights and weekends, he was writing all the code that we were doing. Um, we got the data in and from the OR and said, if you want to do large observational research to determine perioperative risk factors, you need more than one institution. We were doing observational studies. It was single center of Michigan because we had the data from the information system, but it really is just our site and there's so much variability. So we, um, started MPOG with Sachin Nirav and Mike Mathis in a group. It's a, it's a huge group now, statisticians and data science people. Finally, if you want clinicians to know where, when, and which patients that these things apply to, you have to have something that's live supporting them at the time and point of care when they need to know it. And that's when I started working on AlertWatch. 
Um, other part of this, when my father was a test pilot, he got me flying this little plane, J3 Cub, 65 horsepower, 80 mile an hour, top speed and cylinder. Uh, don't fly everything you can't land on. It's, it's hand starting, so you know you, you were gonna land. So following anesthesia and, and aviation have just followed each other incredibly, actually. And this is, uh, these are the um, crashes in commercial. This is per million flights. So about 10 per million, and then they plummet again. Tremendous improvement. What happened here? They started the FAA. They started looking at crashes for the first time. Add 30 years, you've got ASA standards, and the society starts. So we're following them in their footsteps. What happened here? That They were one in a million crashes. You say, what? wouldn't you be satisfied with that? I said, not if you're the pilot. And they have an enlightened self-interest. They're actually on the crashing plane. So they wanted to make it better. And what they did is they changed the cockpit from this multiple, multiple gauges to the glass cockpit. First in military and then in commercial and now in everything has a glass cockpit with a primary flight display. You'll see it when you look in there. Blue sky, brown dirt, yaw pitch horizon. Not that many numbers in there, but the alerts will come up in the order of importance to be addressed by the pilot. So they focus the pilot with tons of data coming in, but focus them on what's important at this moment in time. So trying to follow that analogy in, in 2007, though, a while ago, um, I wrote this on a piece of paper and I took it to an engineering master student. Uh, she had free time. She was going to go get a job at Epic, but she finished her work in March and she I said, can you make this into a thing with like moving lungs and beating heart? And I want to have inputs from the EMR, et cetera. So, um, and, and, and hey, why don't you add red, yellow, green? I've always liked that. Red is bad, green is good. And then there's that little, no, little did I know yellow would be a big problem. Um, so automated calculations to improve care. This is doing stuff. If you were back with me, you know, 16 years ago, you said you're in the oral. What, I used to do INO balance all the time. As a UCLA resident, you had to just keep a track of it. And nobody does that anymore. But why should you? It's in the record, it should do it automatically. So let's do automatic calculations. Pull in the data from the EMR, the record, the laboratories, the flow sheet, which we call the AIMS, and the HMP is information for comorbidities and put it into one display. And um, four years later, we had a prototype. I said, well, okay, let's, let's see how it works. Let's do a study. So I go to the IRB and my study was, put it on for two weeks, turn it off for two weeks. On for two weeks, off for two weeks. See if it makes any difference at all. And the first question, some guy, who was from the engineering school, I don't know why he was there, he said, is this FDA cleared? I go, of course not. What do you mean FDA cleared? Epic's not cleared. Cerner's not cleared. Why would this be cleared? He goes, well, I think it needs to be cleared. I go, well, I, you know, or turn it on and on and off and then get, consent from each patient before they go to the OR. So I'm gonna say, we developed a safety system. We don't know how well it works. Can we turn it off for you? I'm going to get everybody to sign that. First of all, we couldn't even turn it on and off by patient. We, you know, we couldn't do that. So little did I know, 2011, the FDA had the Medical Device Data Systems Act, which classified software as a medical device. And this was clearly MDA's class two device because Below, regulated devices are software that functions to analyze, interpret, and do calculations. And that was the whole purpose of it, was doing calculations live. So that was a problem. So I've looked at the FDA documents. I am not a reader of that type of information. So if you want to get some up-to-date information, they published something in, two, in last fall, September 2002, which is really a great coalition of all the stuff you need to know. And the, the title of this document they published this, your clinical decision support software is a device, yes, no. And they gave examples of it. What it, it asked four questions, the examples, and the final answer was, if it has risk scores for disease conditions, probability of disease conditions are time critical calculations inputs. It's a device, it must go through clearance. So this is like, great, you know, this is gonna be a problem. So studies on hold, I went to the business school because I, you know, what do I do now? And they said, oh, we'll get some patents for you. Don't worry about that. I said, that's great. 
I said, I, I got to run an apartment. They said, we'll find a CEO for you. Don't worry about that. And I said, well, I need some money, don't I? And I said, you find the money. You know, <laughs> so I go, okay. So they were going to put up, and it's even worse than that. We got four patents, talked to the lawyer. It was really great. After they started the company, they said, okay, you owe us $86,000 for the patent attorney. I go, what? You didn't tell me we were, I was going to have to pay for that. I would have talked way faster. I would have, you know, geez. Anyway, five years and $500,000 later, got FDA clearance for this sort of device. So the uh, general layout is that, um, you know, the demo, this is the patient icon display. This is the yaw pitch of the plane. A little more complicated to get, you know, icon for each organ. These are demographics over here. I know balance. I'm alerts on the other side. So I'm going to go through three examples of this and a fourth one from, uh, um, from OB. So it either can be a patient display or it can be a heads up display, basically a flight tower. And this is what WashU has done. WashU is a little surveillance room. They're watching all the OARs. They have a very sophisticated version. Um, they watch and they randomly call into the room if they see a problem. Anybody familiar with that? They're act fast. Brain. Anyway, it's really pretty amazing. Um, I was curious. So they randomly, if they see something funny, they put down what they think is going on, what they would do, and they randomize whether they call the practitioner and say, start discussing this. I go, well, how did they take that? I mean, somebody's like calling you big brother, super big brother. And they say, well, they liked it. They were lonely. Nobody talked to them. So it was like, they weren't so surprised. Didn't take it poorly. Okay, so for an I and O balance, it's pretty simple. You know, four, two, one rule, fluids in, fluids out. But we wanted to give I and O fluids relative to the person's blood volume. So how do you get a blood volume assessment? It's hard to see it here, but this blood volume is, is 3,810 cc, estimated blood volume. So where did that come from? 1962, Nadler, this phys physiologist, did an incredible study on radiotag red cells in volunteers, women, men, short, fat. And then for the validation cohort, um, he did another with radiotag albumin and another study with radiotag red cells. So it was incredibly well done. So they don't do things like that anymore. Um, but it was so old that he said to fit the data, he had to use and IBM, he didn't use a computer. He sent the data to IBM because they had an electronic computer you know, to do this. Um, so that's the equation in there. Height cubed times weight plus a factor. So then I thought, well, if I know the crit and I know the blood volume and all of a sudden I put in 500 cc blood loss, I wonder what the next crit will be. I could give an ongoing sort of estimated crit. So there's this guy... Jeff Feldman did this study in 1995. And he, that, the big fad then was take the blood out, he would elute them, because the blood you give to the blood bank could be contaminated with HIV and who knows what. And then you give them their good blood, keep it in the room nice and warm, platelets working at the end of the case. So I, he has this equation that he uh, developed here. So I stole it, I never told him this. <laughs> and I ran it backwards. <laughs> and instead of saying, here's the, initial crit, and here's the final crit. So I, and I know the blood volume, I put in the EBL from the surgeons, what they lost, and I calculate estimated crit as crit over E to the EBL or EB plus blood added. So that's another example. Another one is um, blood pressure. It's amazing, we started blood pressure in 1906, I'm not first blood pressure, and it was about 100 years later that the first paper came out and said it may affect outcome. And Suchin did a paper on that looking at you know, the RCRI, Leeds Revised Cardiac Risk Index that has all the preoperative characteristics and post -op. They That study, 99 circulation, didn't use any intraoperative data because they didn't have it. So we said, let's redo that with intraoperative data. And one of the factors he found was heart rate tachycardia over 100, blood pressure below 50 for 10 minutes, or 40% drop for 10 minutes. That was followed a few years later by the study at Walsh, the Cleveland Clinic, which everybody's probably familiar with, that basically showed that for troponin rise over here, creatinine rise over here, for kidney injury, cardiac injury, this is cumulative time, 10, 15, makes 25, plus 10, makes 35, cumulative time under that pressure. And this is 75, 70, 65, 50. When this came out in anesthesiology, it had gigantic 55 on the front of the journal. 
And they all said, it should have said 60 <laughs> or even 65. Um, but so that's, that's easy to do for the computer. You just hear this. There's, as soon as you get to 10 minutes, it just stays up there, red alert. You're now at 12 minutes, you're at 15 minutes, you're at 25 minutes, you're at 30 minutes. At some point in time, you go, well, this person um, may be at risk for post operative problems. They've got like 34, and you take over a case, they've been 36 minutes below 60. You can adjust that metric. There's a little adjustment bar there to make it below 65 or below 70, wherever you want it to show. Um, so actually, another shout out here to Mike Mathis. He did a follow-up study on this saying, um, does it affect how sick you are going into the OR? Correct me if I'm wrong, Mike. Anyway, so if you're super sick, very sensitive to renal injury if you're not so sick. So these are you know, four different risk categories, super sick, medium sick, not so sick, healthiest of the sick. These are all patients admitted to the hospital. They all got uh, creatinine strong post-op. But the um, amazingly, the not so super sick ones down here were unaffected by hypotension. And these are very effective by hypertension. So a little more than just one, one pressure fits all. So we went back into this study. This study was published in Anesthesia. This is, this is a terrible study. And uh, the editorial written about it focused on what a terrible study it was. I knew it was a terrible study. It's retrospective, one you know, mark against it. It was user versus non-user. So it was user selection. This was in there, faculty or CRNA could pick it up and look at it, or could they not pick it up? So we knew some of the people, the application was never brought up. So we know the non-users for sure. The users are brought up, we don't know if they ever looked at it. It's on a separate screen, but you know, their next trip to Hawaii or their, you know, their, whatever. So there, it was, I'd say that the, Users were probably at best 50% users. The non-users were truly non-users. Um, so we looked at uh, several outcomes in uh, 26,000 patients. These are all patients expected to be admitted to the hospital for two days or more. So they were not, they were in big cases. There was some process measures. There was, there was less hypotension. There was a more consistent crystalloid, tidal volume fell within 68 cc's. The primary outcome measures are gonna be, is there less troponin and creatinine bumps? Not really, they were really different. Um, but there was a length of stay from six days to five days and encounter charges of uh, less 3,600. Um, but that kind of got lost in the, what a terrible study this is. You know, Dan Susserman used, used to be best friend. Um, so escalating alert. So this, so this is the first level of decision support. It's doing calculations you would do if you had time and a calculator. It would be painful, but you could do it. This is the uh, alerts um, for protocols. So we had two uh, near-miss OB events close by each other within a month or so. Um, they really, uh, when you have a near-miss event in OB, it, it's uh, frightening. Um, and so they saw the alert watch, they said, could you make a version for labor and delivery to watch the mothers? So we got uh, Tom Klumpner is one of our OB anesthesiologists, computer groupie. Now that's usually a contradiction in terms, no offense to OB anesthesiologists, but the computer group is usually ICU or part cardiac, they're usually not going to be, but he's, he's uh, very talented. So this is labor and delivery, 50 rooms, same kind of layout, this is surveillance room, in the, uh, the dark, this is triage, antipartum, yellow, active labor. Um, these are, this is pushing, this is phase two, they're fully dilated, and this is postpartum. So there are two things that, that cause maternal, the two primary causes, late detection of postpartum hemorrhage and late detection and poor treatment of preeclampsia, those two things, and the NIH says, 50% of these, at least 50% are completely preventable. So I have a woman in a hospital with an IV, bleed to death, you know, just doesn't seem like it should happen. It's like dead in bed, but, um, and this is the most depressing thing. A dead child is not as bad as a dead new mom. I mean, you look at the impact is just earth shattering that, um, if a mother dies in the hospital. So um, with these two events, we got forward in doing this. So the, the user interface looks the same kind of, but it's got a little baby in here. 
And these are demographics, you know, gravity, parity, et cetera, progress of labor. And there's a series of alerts. So the first alerting thing we wanted was there's ACOG PPH risk factors. And there's a list of high risk and there's a list of medium risk. You have one of the high risk, you go into a high risk group. If you have two or more of the low risk, you go into a high risk group. And green is good, yellow's okay, red's bad. Orange means comorbidity with that organ. So this, this organ, uterus, has orange around it, means it's a comorbidity. That woman has gone into a high risk group. And these are the list of, of uh, ACOGs, one of these or two or more of these. Some of these are, we, the nurses are supposed to, to assess this, right? So one of these has been on oxytocin for more than 24 hours. So they're supposed to go and try to figure out when did they start? Do I know if they had a risk factor? These are literally impossible for the nurses to do. They try to do them once a day. They prefer it once a shift, but it's really, they're taking care of patients. So to look at these and try to see which ones they triggered. Uh, so this is, it's all in the medical record. We know when the oxytocin started, you know, when it hits 24, boom, they're high risk. As soon as it's high risk, it looks at the IV size of the mom, needs to be 18 or greater, and sees the blood bank to see if there's blood for that woman in the blood bank. And if it doesn't have either one, it puts an alert. Consider typing cross, or typing screen at least, and get an IV size. So this, this one has an alert that says, whoops, PPH risk, uh, put an 18 gauge or greater. I don't know if you're up there, we get people that are, the biggest concern of anesthesia in our unit had been, why didn't they call us sooner? Or they're really giving a unit of blood on the floor in a 22 gauge IV. I mean, you know, so we try not to get upset. I go, you know, OB trained, my wife's an OB, I love OB, I love her, but they did zero months of critical care. Zero months of critical care, um, at least in our institution. So if a first year resident if they see somebody that looks sick, it's like, I see dead people, you know? If you think they're sick and everybody else is just dancing around, they're sick. Don't be distracted by all the happy thoughts. You know, it's like, ROB is 50 rooms with like 12 simultaneous weddings going on. Everybody's happy, excited, new grandparents. Do. But um, if when they turn sour, they go sour fast. The other thing is um, the news uh, criteria. Maternal early warning criteria. This is heart rate, blood pressure, a bunch of criteria. It's like for the floor, but this is for OB. And they're supposed to call, escalate care, whoever the escalator is, but frequently it's a resident or an OB resident or a physician when they meet these criteria. So we ran through the criteria and the number of calls would be astronomical, astronomical, if they just follow that criteria. So we said, we can't just follow those criteria per se. So what we did is we added shock index. This is shock index. This line is when the delivery. So during phase two active pushing, we're not worried about triggering any alerts. The woman's pushing, there's people in the room, so don't trigger anything. To hold all the alerts, as soon as they deliver, activate all the PBH alerts. Um, so the first study of this, this is the, looks complicated, but this is, the metro algorithm that they'll go through, the machines going through to determine who to call when. Hypotension, hypertension for the OBs wanted uh, hypertension for preeclampsia, um, tachycardia, shock index. We threw in anemia. They thought of the blood comes back or the crit 18, somebody should know, um, and shock index, which at that time wasn't part of it. And the FDA pushed back on this. We had to reapply to get shock index. Later studies have come out that it's a very useful variable. So we promoted it, we used a filter. This is like the best filter ever, the nurse. So if there's an abnormal vital sign, automatically pages the nurse for that patient says, please recheck this. If they recheck it within five minutes and it's okay, all's good. If they recheck it and it's not good, physicians automatically call. If they don't recheck it, they're paged again. They don't recheck it then, physician's called. So they know that if there's a funny vital sign, they now are just taking it again because um, they know there's going to be a physician waking up. Now, when we looked at the past outcomes, you get it would be usually a junior nurse is given the worst shifts 
They're relatively two in the morning, whatever. You know, they said, ah, it's, you know, it's not that low. And they just wait a little while. They're hesitant to wake somebody out in the middle of the night. The previous somebody yelled at them or whatever. But this, there's, this actually eliminated all yelling. They could yell at us, but it's the computer. <laughs> the nurse didn't page them. The computer did. And it's by an algorithm that the OBs agreed to, the nurses agreed to, we agreed to. We all agreed these are the things that should call a physician to get to the bedside to assess the patient. So all the, the emotional who to wake up when it disappeared because it's the computer. They could blame me. I, I told them to bring Klumpner. He's the one that designed it. I was just a bystander. Um, and they get paged. Now that's phone, but they just get paged. Shock index, you know, repeated, go to the patient's bedside. So we looked at the criteria, what, what happened with the, uh, the number of pages. <clears throat> so these are for blood pressure, low, blood pressure, high, um, heart rate. And um, these are the number, the MUSE criteria. This is in 24 hours for a 50 bed unit. There were 150, there was a page every eight minutes. The nurses follow the published criteria by maternal learning warning criteria. Every eight minutes, a doctor would be paged. You can see why they're not doing that. So the, um, after we applied the don't set off alarms during active pushing and when you have to deliver, uh, and then this nurse recheck, the physicians are paged uh, every 6.3 hours. The nurses are paged 47 times a day. That's 50 nurses. The nurses are paged every two and a half shifts. They get one page. So the nurses themselves, every individual nurse, they're getting a page about once a day. So they were not upset with it. Um, the OB residents who got paged the most were most happy. And we did a survey, OB, anesthesia, nursing. And the question we said made it simple. Should we keep this? Should we throw it away? 84% said keep it. I've not gotten anything from 84%. Um, OB residents, 100% said we need this. Do not, and they're the ones that pay the We got the, the bad comments were from family practice faculty. What was interesting is they weren't even in the paging algorithm. They never got paged and they hated it. I was like, what's, what's with them? Um, <laughs> So we compared, the final was look at the outcome. So we called severe postpartum hemorrhage was um, four units transfused, two units plus FFP, return to the OR, hysterectomy, uterine artery embolization, admit to the ICU. Those are criteria that we call a severe hemorrhage. We looked at uh, 7,800 um, deliveries. We had 120 severe postpartum hemorrhage events, about 1.5%. And the... Um, you can read this, probably too small, but the we compared nursing criteria. That's it. So they followed the early morning, early morning criteria, assuming that it was done perfectly, 24/7. Um, they had a positive predictive value of of 3.3 percent, and we had 5.1 percent on our modified one, and probably because we threw in shock index and low hemoglobin. So. The, in addition, there was, um, these are the criteria, 5.1 versus 3.3 positive predictive value. And there were, of the 120, there were 10, and these were pages that went off before the patient was taken to the OR. So they were alerting pages by either alert watch system and or the, um, what would have happened if they had the regular use criteria. But there were 10 that were completely missed by the um, use criteria, which were kind of surprised. Okay, last but not least, alerts um, that could not be turned. This is machine learning. I have a little bit on this, but not much because Mike Mathis has done it all. So on this section, I'll just jump through and you imagine what Mike said stuffed in between here. Um, only example I have is, is uh, Epic's um, sepsis model. We got a study at Michigan, said it didn't work so well. Another place said it worked pretty well. Um, so it goes to show if you make a model on one institution, you can apply it to another and get a different result. That's the problem they were talking about. Patient population, timing of the data set, and the algorithm will change. So this is causing, I think, a major concern 
in, uh, with the FDA. Because um, Alertwatch has gone through four FDA clearances. Every time we make a change, every time we take anything, we had to do colorblind testing. Colorblind testing, oh my gosh. Then we had four months to get them to approve yellow. They said, show us the published data on the yellow range. I go, well, I mean, there isn't any. I, like, American College of Pathology, these are all the, unless there's a published yellow range, you can't do it. I said, hmm. I said, you drive a car, right? You know that middle light? We could just take that out. I, I, think, I think it would be worse. And they all of a sudden, after like four months, they just said, okay. I'm like, anyway, this is really causing a problem. They've had several meetings. They've on, online things you can get into that you hear about their discussions of how they're going to manage AI-driven alerts and risk factor assessment because it, it's their whole system is based on Give us the data, show us the publications, show us the calculations, show us the results. For AI-generated alerts, you can do the same thing, but once you have one data set and you have one number generated, that's the one you're stuck with. And then you add newer data, then you have to go and get another clearance, which would be tremendously expensive and time-consuming. So they have this thing they call predetermined change control plan. So that will be what people need to do. When they're sending in their first clearance for their deterioration index, they said, and this is our change control plan, what we're going to do. And they're actually pretty good at it. They're, they're, they'll do, you know, check you, they'll have an audit, but they're giving you an opportunity to allow us to improve at a much quicker pace, given the amount of data and the uh, technical capabilities. So my opinion of the issues are not insufficient analysis in machine learning, because I think we're going to manage those problems well. It just takes time. It, currently, it's insufficient, accurate, high-resolution data. We did a study predicting uh, uh, COVID patients that need intubation, and we found a really good predictor. The most biggest predictor was SpO2 to FiO2 ratio, the made-up FiO2, the 0.21 plus 0.04 per every liter of oxygen fake FIO2. But um, that data was collected every four to eight hours, highest frequency. So what we've been talking about today, where data will be coming in live um, from patients, will make a game changer for all this. So thank you very much for your time. And I think that's the end here. Okay.